Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Event Industry News Podcast. Today, I am joined with Caitlin, who is the digital producer at George P. Johnson, um, specifically looking after all the social engagement across their clients. Caitlin, welcome to the podcast. Oh, well, thank you for having me. <laughs> Caitlin, I, I want to get right into it. What does a digital producer do for an agency like George P. Johnson? So it's a good question. Uh, so I can only say what I do. Uh, and actually, technically, I think I might be the only digital producer currently at GPJ. So it kind of works in this. Um, but I uh, work with our UK clients predominantly on kind of their social media work for their events. And uh, most of that is kind of in most of it, all of it's pretty much in the B2B space um, with tech clients so cisco for cisco live and then also have done some work with kind of ibm and um, other clients in the past so does that take place as an all year round engagement or do you specifically work on the events leading up to it at it per show how does it work is it something you kind of take take care of all year round or is it is it just around the event it's well it depends on what we're being asked to do so Cisco Live Europe is the main event I work on, and that is a all year round, 365 day event focus, event focus, social kind of focus. The event is only one week of the year, but we're producing content across all of it. So right now we had the event 2020 in end of January, and we're currently in what would typically be our quiet period. Obviously with what's going on, it's a little bit more quiet. Sure. Um, and that one we have to, yeah, we create content all year. But then for other clients, uh, it could be just specifically about a particular activation that they have at an event. Uh, it might be doing some stuff pre or post, but it, it can, a lot of the time it then does just focus on what they're promoting for that kind of one aspect of that. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So it depends, really depends on the type of event and what the customer mm. kind of wants wants out of it right so what what does a typical campaign look like do you do you focus on different socials for different customers is yeah. there like because let's face it the people that are going to be listening to this are going to be looking to to hear you caitlin go just put all your eggs into snapchat like that, that, <laughs> they want some focus they want to know the tricks of the trade right they want to know, oh, know because there's so many isn't there there's there's there there's so many social platforms as event industry news we have our audience split across so many so it is pretty much a full-time job to kind of make sure that you're engaging yeah. with people all over but sometimes it's you put more more effort into to one area right yeah well so yes we do and i think i mean this is it is going to be that typical answer that i think you normally get when people go well it depends on what you're trying to do and it depends <laughs> sure. on the audience you're trying to engage um and unfortunately that is kind of a main part of it who, where who are your audience and where are they and also what are your objectives um i mean i i think a lot of the time when we talk about b2b people get a little bit intimidated by it like there's a difference a difference between a professional and a consumer um seems to be where people fall into it and um, that mm. you shouldn't be using snapchat to get to a certain audience snapchat's probably the worst example for this because it's not the best place to be but i often look at it as in their individuals and, and they're humans so where are they going to be where's the audience going to be on on a weekend um it doesn't matter if they are a tech you know working it as an engineer and predominantly i don't know they they're using reddit to find a lot of information or communities but actually they spend a lot of time as an individual on instagram if they see something on instagram that's relevant to work they're not going to dis discount it because it's mm -hmm. they're interested in it you're not you know you don't you don't just go to work monday to friday and don't think about it on the weekends or evenings so i think we do focus on a couple of channels so i'll use cisco as kind of the main example but yeah. we have i think the largest audience is on twitter we're active on facebook and instagram and we have a presence on on linkedin we don't have we don't focus that much attention on linkedin and part of that is because for cisco live europe we have a separate set of accounts for them but obviously it is part of cisco their global account and cisco have a big presence on linkedin so you're more likely to get a better audience um engagement if you go through cisco's own 
channel they have a bigger audience and uh that's that's going to have more traction than if mm -hmm. we start posting individually but we found i think in the last few years that places like facebook and instagram have really got like a bigger audience and two years ago i would never have said that because that engineering audience weren't on there but because right, more right. and more people and i think this is like down to how we like say we but you as an individual how how we're using social nowadays it's not just young people on Inst young people it's not just teenagers on, Inst on instagram again the same with like tiktok it isn't just teenagers there is a larger audience on there so it's what's, kind your, of... what's your opinion on tiktok then because it's it's something <laughs> that i've recently downloaded and and started to look at and i've posted a few things there myself more I would say on a, on a personal front rather than a business front on, on some of my other socials, I'm very much focused myself as yeah. my own personal brand for event interviews, event tech live, et cetera. And TikTok's a really interesting one because it, it feels more on the actually more, let's say, um, where let's say a B2B brand could be a little bit more risky, a little bit more mm -hmm. fun, a little bit more, not, not just like, oh, this is us and this is our event and it's very professional. Like, And I've seen a lot of individuals actually within the events industry talk to use some of the tactics around the video engagement on TikTok, which I think mm. is really interesting with music and voiceover and that kind of stuff and, and the content to actually engage on things like LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. And it, it pops out. Yeah. So what, what's your own personal opinion on, on TikTok? Well, I mean, personally, I'm a big have you fan. Got, have you got an account? I have. have I do an have account. an account. And, and at the start, at the start of this lockdown, I was very much trying to learn dances, and then it became apparent I'm not good at that, so I've I've, I've moved over. But I I think it's a. I think what you I think you kind of said it right. There are tactics within that platform within TikTok mm -hmm. that will work exceptionally well at standing out in places like LinkedIn and even on Instagram places like that, and so. I would be hesitant like i wouldn't i would be very unlikely for for like when we look at cisco 2021 to be like oh we need a TikTok account because i'm like we can't create the right content for that place but the elements that work in as you say whether it's the dancing the music the short bite-sized elements those pieces you can then move to kind of the other channels where where you have a have a presence but is it, it's also an interesting one because I think I think TikTok works when it's about people. So it's about an individual yeah. as a as a brand. I wouldn't be able to say whether it would actually work like. And I think that's a really good definition. And, and that's what I've seen. It, it's very much about the individual. Right. So maybe if Cisco Live had a prominent figure as part mm. of the event that maybe they're attitude the, the you know the, the outlook on life is very much kind of in keeping with with tiktok they could probably be on that platform and very much post about themselves and yeah. have that social uh, have that personal brand element come into it representing cisco or cisco yeah. live for example so i guess you just have to explore it a little bit right in terms of what i'm, I'm coming back to this the, the original question which is you kind of have to explore each one to see what yes. what works for you as a as an event organizer, mm. right? Yeah, and I mean, I I've worked with clients where their I mean their their output, their kind of the strategy around how they use social is very business focused. It's you talk about the product or what you're trying to sell, and that's that's kind of it. And there isn't any real uh, leeway to bring in that humanized aspect of social. So when you work with those clients it's i was, was going to call it like more traditional aspects of social but you focus more on visual um pieces that really portray kind of the key facts but when you you can be very lucky like i would say we are with cisco live that cisco as a as a company has a real ethos of of the people that make it that, and they that runs through all of their different disciplines and especially when it comes to the live event i mean there's three of them globally each year and it's where you get to meet people face to face and because they have that ethos we're able to really focus on community side which means we can have more fun with the type of content that's going out because it's talking about these individual people at the event and that community that community side and it plays really well to to social 
So for Cisco then, what I'm understanding is you very much focus on really high engagement visuals, but still use the community as part of that content to portray maybe what others might get from the event if they attend. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, I'd say the second part more so. So okay. because because it's a for people who don't know, Cisco is a it's a it's an annual tech event. So it's it's engineers, it's it's developers, it's it's IT managers. So they are extremely knowledgeable on this technology that that is being discussed and uh, kind of shared at the event. And you have I think something like a thousand I think it was like a thousand sessions across those four and a half days so it's a huge amount of learning now i cannot talk about any of that in any detail i, I get an idea of what cloud is and uh, what a router is and there's my like there's my understanding and so yeah. when it comes to marketing this event at no point are we, are the Cisco Live Europe social, and I'll refer to us as a team because we are a team when it comes to on-site. We're not trying to be the experts in what Cisco Live is talking about, like yeah. if you attend. So what we have to work on is how do you, how do you showcase the real, I suppose, what you get out from attending the event in a way that we can understand it. And that comes from that comes from the community that comes from the speakers who do the session, it comes from the network operation team who build, they're the guys who basically build the network for the live event across the five days. And is weirdly popular with the audience. It's not weirdly popular. It's, it makes a lot of sense if you worked in that space. But it's amazing how how much that team is like, I was gonna say if you went to a rock concert, and you have like you see someone famous you're like oh my god and it's like the knock team of that like people are like oh my god you built this network um so we bring in that expertise because i can't i mean i can tell you it's a great event and i know it is but i can't tell you why and you're not going to trust me but you would trust someone who is either an attendee of that event or is a speaker and can explain the benefits to you so that's where we focus the attention i love that for two reasons one um harping back to um, a video I saw with the founder of Ugg Boots who kind of explained his journey on on marketing Ugg Boots, which the boots, right? It's just, yeah. they're, they're a shit. <laughs> um, he said the golden light switch moment was he stopped marketing the product and he started marketing how the product made people feel. Oh. And I think that's really important with events like event marketing and social marketing around events is it's generally very much focused on speakers content you know mm. that kind of stuff which which is it absolutely has a place because people need to know that in order to mm -hmm. see relevant to them but for me what's more enticing is almost like that festival-esque kind of content which is like you're having a great time with your network of friends and the people and it's it's as much as about learning as i, I really even see in b2b there's this we don't talk about it much, but there's this massive crossover into socialization, right? It's mm -hmm. like the events create friends. They, they yes. really do, even in, even in a B2B environment. You know, I, I, I arguably probably sometimes socialize more at events than I do with my like, non-event friends. <laughs> but that's, that's amazing to see how Cisco have adapted that to promote like, okay, so this is a great event. It's about networking. It's about technology. It's very, it's clearly very technical and, and lots of opportunity. In fact, when I went, like, like we were saying before, about six years ago, I can remember a whole like classroom set up for people to, to learn and they pay to learn that. Right. But that's just one element of it. There's stuff that happens in the evening and a wrap and around it. And I'm sure there's people that meet up, I'm sure there's probably people who we've even got married out of Cisco. I'd, I'd put a thousand oh. pound on it. Do oh, you know I what really I mean? wanted to find this out now. <laughs> okay, I'm write that down. That's a, that's, a, that's a challenge for you. Come back to us on that. But this is what, you know, I know of events where people have connected. And one of the greatest events I went to, which was Web Summit, which I know was there for the content. I connected up with so many people through that. And, and they've done a fantastic job of wrapping this kind of like night mm. summit event around it to, to facilitate that. So I think, I think that's great. But I also think it's great because it really shows the value of face-to-face -face events. Like at the moment with coronavirus on, there's a lot of talk about pivoting to digital and 
putting sessions online and, and facilitating meetings and business and learning and all that kind of stuff. And that can absolutely take place on, online. But what I think will still forever be missing a part of that, and, and this is where maybe a hybrid future comes into play, is people you know, meeting in the, car, in the corridor or bumping into each other. Or me going, Caitlin, you should meet Dave. You and Dave yeah. don't know each other, but you, you've got so much in common. You should connect up. And the law, the, that's where, that's what's so amazing. There's, there's so much serendipity around face-to-face events and how it makes you feel. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it's great to see your portraying that in, in kind of what, what you can do with social, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's an, it's an interesting one. We're, I think we're, at a, I mean, Cisco Live Europe 2021 is end of February or in February next year. Mm-hmm. And obviously, at this point, we're working towards that as it is because it's quite far away in yeah. in the grand schemes of, of things. But when we had the event this year, right after, I think it was in March, um, was when it was meant to be the Australia event. And in June is when it's meant to be the US event. And obviously those two had to pivot to going online. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, Cisco is very lucky because it does have a, have a community element stem through its whole company so there's things that you can still do but it's a very interesting time to be seeing how and not just in at cisco in general how people try to pivot that as you say that networking that that connection that is so natural at live events and try and bring an element of that into an online bit and it naturally falls i think well i've I've seen it into that social piece because again on twitter and with hashtags and on Instagram, you can connect people mm. through that. Yeah. But yeah. it's never, I mean, it isn't going to replicate anywhere close to what you get from, from a live event. And I completely agree. I mean, I think about all the events that I go to and the best ones, hands down, good education. But if I know at least one or two people there, then yeah. it becomes way better because I'm then meeting different people i always think of like convex as that like i quite like i yeah. really enjoy going to convex does it have you know is my job role the most relevant to go maybe not but it is where i meet up with people who i haven't seen probably in a year two years like mm-hmm. and have great great meetings and 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 just hanging out in general so and there's there's still absolute value to that you know obviously the organizers of Confex and like us, they, they, they put those events on to facilitate business and networking, right? And, and networking is a huge part of that. And, and if that's what you get out of coming and you never spend any money with a vendor, which is probably unlikely, but you know, or you never attend a session, which, which I rarely attend sessions because I'm so busy networking and, and yeah. connecting up with people, then that's absolutely fine. I think, I think that's enough for people to go to an event, right? Yeah. You don't necessarily need to go, well, I've got to go shopping or I've got to, come away with three hours worth of education today because I need yeah. it, you know I need to say this is what's happening so I think I think that's I think that's a great point there's there's one other element of social I'd love to get your opinion on okay and this is the rise of live broadcasting right oh, yes. this is you know <laughs> we, uh, and and Jesus, haven't we seen live broadcasting <sighs> since half during the pandemic? Um, you know, this was something that the, the social platforms were, were heavily invested in. You could see it was part of their long-term plan, mm-hmm. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, you know, and even even like TikTok, which we mentioned earlier, has live streaming capabilities, haven't they? And then now there's yeah. platforms that allow you to stream one video to multiple platforms so you can kind of reach your audience no matter where they are. And from my understanding, you may be able to explain a little bit more on this, social platforms like Facebook actually put a higher emphasis on live broadcasting in terms of the way that they push it to your audience. Um, it, it, it seems to me that it ranks much higher or, or gets much more visibility in front of people within groups or that you're mm-hmm. connected to. And, and even further out, uh, out of a field from that, I, I saw an awards program that was published on Facebook and it reached over 8,000 viewers. Um, so what, what's your opinion on, on, on live? Does that, for you, play, is it totally separate to social? Does it play a part in that because it appears on the social platforms? How do you see it? It's, okay, well, there's two sides to it. I think from, from my experience of, of my work, it's not, always viewed as part of the social strategy so cisco do a huge we do cisco live broadcasts across the week 
uh, not just on the Cisco websites, but equally on like Twitter and Facebook, I think YouTube, um, yep. quite a lot of places really when I think about it and and it's not we're involved in like promoting it and obviously mm -hmm. because it's on our channels we're, we're aware of it's going on but it's not necessarily part of our strategy because it's it, it falls slightly differently to our focus as a team um it does get a huge amount of engagement like the Facebook live videos are like a huge audience I personally have an have an interest well interesting maybe it's not negative but I think I do have a slight um difference of opinion to some people on the benefit of it I mean I think they're great if you are wanting almost anyone and everyone to see your content and and I think you can obviously specialize that you can be um quite particular when it comes to kind of paid and how you promote stuff mm -hmm. but live videos on social social is naturally a place where people tend to click through things quite quickly you're catching up on stuff you're scrolling a lot of the time i don't think it's always the right place to broadcast an event i think youtube for sure makes sense it's a channel that people go to to watch videos you'll watch a 10 minute video to a 45 minute video if you're interested like that's a good place to be instagram live well you know I enjoy some of them and then sometimes <laughs> I tune in. Swipe right, swipe right. Swipe right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll click in a little bit and I'll be like, great. I don't really know. Because again, you're catching it part way through. And I think, yeah. I don't think we're at a point where it's, there's a difference between kind of webinars and live broadcast events where there's, it's a closed platform. You're committing to your time. Mm -hmm. When stuff's broadcast live on social, you're trying to catch people's attention. And sometimes that works, but a lot of the time it might not. So I think it depends on, goes back to that thing, what's the objective of it? Like, yep. I, I mean, I've definitely found it. And I, you know, I, I do outside of work, do um, an initiative called Event First Steps, which is aimed at yep. people in the industry starting out. And although I'm saying all this stuff about I don't like live, we are actually doing a live video tomorrow <laughs> for oh, the first time. I know, I'm like, oh, I don't like it. But, but when, we, when we were talking about, well, what, what do we do with this content? I was like, well, the thing is, we can do it as a live. People can jump in, jump out. It, we can get people asking questions. And I said, and then we'll take it and put it on IGTV. And for me, if it's being used later on, then I think it's fine. Because you might catch some people and they'll be like, okay, I'll, I'll check it out when it's actually yeah. uploaded. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, it really depends on. I, I think. I think. This. I think. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Um, let, let's be fair. Attention span on most socials is probably what a couple of seconds, realistically. Yeah. And that's what great. What's what great about Instagram is because within those few seconds, if you like something, if it resonates with you, you can like it. You can give feedback to the content creator mm -hmm. or the person that holds the account uh, without much commitment, right? Yeah. And I think Facebook is a great example of how true that is because I've noticed if I engage with any form of live video, whether it's live right then, or it's kind of like the live, the live replay. Yeah. As soon as I click away from it, it goes, do you want to save this video for later? <laughs> so that, that says to me that, you know, probably more than 80, 90% of people are only engaging with that content initially for a very short period of time mm. where like your point about YouTube, YouTube does not ask you that. It does not, yeah. even though it's got the, like, watch this later, add it to a list, add it to a playlist, favorite it, all that kind of stuff. The algorithm is very good at putting content in front of you that it knows you like, mm -hmm. um, but it never really promotes the fact that, do you want to watch this later? Do you want to, because you've clicked away like 30 seconds into it. It just, it just accepts it. It's people will watch mm -hmm. what they watch. And if they don't, they, they're clicking away because they're uninterested. Yeah. Well, there's, there's also really interesting features and I can't remember if it's Facebook that does it. And although I use Facebook, I'm not, I don't know too much. I mean, I, I've kind of moved slightly away from it. So I probably okay. should be no, more knowledgeable than I am. But th there are some where you start watching and if you scroll, it kind of pops out. Yep. I think it does it on desktop. And then I like that feature because then I'm yep. like, well, I'll carry on watching then because I yep. can... I can go yeah, and do can, something you, else. You can kind of do it out. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's a great example of, and that's my podcast. Right? Listen, right? You can like, kind of listen yeah. to them in the background while you're carrying on. So maybe we should have that more in mind when you're creating video content. Just focus on really good audio. <laughs> then yeah. Just... Well, it's true though. I mean, I actually was watching a. I didn't watch it. My flatmate was watching it, but she had a live video on, 
So an mm-hmm. Instagram live discussion and she had the phone on the other side of the room and she's like, I just wanted to listen to something. And it yeah. was so informative. Like it was like a podcast. And I yeah. was like, oh, I really enjoyed this half an hour that I didn't think I'd suddenly be sat <laughs> listening to these people have a chat. Um, so I think sometimes, yeah, if you think about how people engage with content, then you can utilize these, you know, video platforms to to kind of focus more, as you say, on the audio bit or people doing other stuff at the same time. That's good. great advice, Karen. Great advice. I guess I, I've got, I've got, a, I'm conscious of time, but I've got a bunch of other questions I want, I want to get through with you. Um, I know now that anybody listening to this, me included, wants to know what you use as tools to power yeah. your social media. Because there's so many out there, right? There's there's paid, there's free, there's automations, there's new ones popping up all the time. There's ones that cover all the spectrum of socials. There's one that just focus on certain aspects of socials or certain social platforms. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to give your secrets away, but <laughs> like, if you could give people listening to this through your experience and, and, and keep bear in mind things like security and data protection and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff are very hot at the moment, like account yeah. access, all that kind of stuff. What, what's your advice? What, what would be your top tools for people within the event space managing their socials? I think oh, it's a, I mean, it's a tough question. I think most people, if you're lucky enough to work in a team or you have people that can also work in it, then for me, the biggest thing would be to look for a platform uh, that allows you to schedule content through it. So and also then monitor what's happening. So do it all in one space. Um, I use Sprinkler is, is one of the ones we use, but there's loads of other accounts out there. Even stuff like, I think, is it Hootsuite? You can also- yeah, We use Hootsuite. I've not heard of yeah. Sprinkler there before. That's, that's it's a, a new a one. Pay, it's a paid one. So mm-hmm. I think, again, it depends on, on your level into it. But I think having a a one place and and using that as the place that you go mm-hmm. is useful if you have a team because then no one's you're not having to give individual people certain access to certain I mean they can yeah. still access it so just be aware of that and they you're can in more control of it right you're in control yeah. of it yeah. in terms of limiting access and stuff yeah and you can see who's responding so it's easier than doing it natively um I mean in terms of other tools, I work predominantly in, in organic pieces. So I don't, we don't really look after paid stuff for our clients. And that's because most of them have either marketing teams within their own business, or they already have a paid agency that work for their broader business. Um, but I think paid is a great space. And I think anyone, especially in B2B, um, there's definitely room to kind of to work on that. I was listening to one of the podcasts that you guys did a couple of weeks ago and I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but she was doing, she's talking about page. She works oh, in Laura, for, Tag, for Tag Digital. Yes. Yes. And she that works was for really, our own, yeah. Yeah. So that she was really good. And I think even if you're work, like if you look at B2B and you're the only person who's looking after that kind of social output, you don't have to know everything like there are people that you can reach out to to be to be better at it and i mean i'm a strong believer in that and i think part of it comes from the fact that i'm often marketing events where i have little to no understand like real understanding of what is being discussed in those places because it's way above my understanding um but understand like but understanding who you can bring in to make Mm -hmm. sure that your content is is better and being seen by the most amount of people but i think I, i would say quick tips is yeah utilizing one place to to schedule and see what's going out and also actually having a tool where you can schedule because then you don't have any worries about posting on a weekend (laughs) like you don't have to actually post on a weekend you can schedule it on a friday and it goes out that's a good that's always a good tactic yeah i suppose as well you uh, it's a good tactic because it might be a little bit of a quieter time in the b2b space so it's great to, Mm -hmm. to catch people's times i know obviously certain platforms lend themselves more to certain times of the day right you know mm-hmm. people probably not on Facebook too much or shouldn't be on Facebook too much if they're working <laughs> through the day but maybe they're more on Twitter and LinkedIn and stuff like that and, mm-hmm. and again there's probably times of the day where people are very much more focused on productivity rather than checking what's going off in an industry and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. so yes I, I suppose scheduling can really help with with that to yeah. make sure the message gets out at the right time. And it's an interesting thing, actually, because I think at the, at currently, and I've had conversations with our clients about this as well, but like at the moment, because everyone's at home, I think that mm. concept of, oh, when's the right time? People aren't on Facebook. And I'm like, but 
you're catching it you're having to keep up to date with family and a lot of stuff and i think now mm. a lot of what was traditionally there has potentially slightly moved away because <laughs> i mean i've got colleagues who are doing very weird working hours because they have families so i know one guy's doing 7 a.m till i think it's 1 p.m working and then his wife works in the afternoon so they can balance it out so again yep. you know if he was checking facebook he would be doing it in a technically working day so i think you know so now all the rules have gone out of the window basically slightly, yeah sense. basically <laughs> <laughs> all the stuff you thought you knew rip that rule book up just post whenever <laughs> see what sticks i, I guess the, the leading on from that um another question for me would be what kind of statistics and what kind of goals do you guys have for your customers in terms of that proves that what you've done was a value because mm. I know a lot of people just focus merely on impressions, but that's not necessarily the only way to kind of measure success. What, what's, what's your advice again around how to quantify what's working, what's not working yeah. and what's, what's, what's a value? I mean, yeah, well, obviously, Again, I'll start this by saying it depends what you're trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, going to be the this is going to be the headline of, of know, this podcast. Sorry. It depends on what you're going to do, <laughs> but it but it it slightly does because I think um, if your main focus on on your social is to sell tickets to the event, then obviously mm -hmm. the metric that you'll be looking for is well, what's the actual conversion to ticket sales? Great for us. I mean, I'm not a. I think impressions and reach is great for paid. I think seeing a larger audience, fantastic when I focus on organic pieces and, and with our clients, it's far more on engagements. So likes, comments, yep. like, you know, and, and actually a huge, a big one that we've really tried to focus on is, is shares. Like if someone yeah. is sharing a post, that's actually probably it's a more important. It? Yeah. It's someone yeah, going, yeah. here's something that you're going to find interesting. Um, so for us, engagement is really high. That's because we're working for Cisco, especially on a year round, focus so obviously my engagement level right now minimal you know it's not yeah. a lot but if we because at the moment i tend to be sharing kind of fun or cool tech diys that people can be doing using arduino to build some smart alarm clock was one of the ones that we posted recently okay. um and if someone shares that you're like well that's that's positive like if, yeah. if a couple of people are engaging with it that's great um but i think because we're looking at community as being a, a large proportion of, of what we're trying to build on on that on our social channels then engagement naturally works with it um so yeah i mean it like it is it fully depends on would you goals. say though and this is me putting you on the spot would you say yeah. a comment and a share is worth 10 impressions kind of is, it, is there like you know can you can you wow. put a value on it like that like because everybody always tends to go like oh a million people looks at my post yeah but like, you can't do anything about it it's me right? yeah i i would say well i always think about it when you look at influencers right you get influencers mm -hmm. who have a million followers and yet if you look at their posts they get 20 engaged like actual mm -hmm. engagements mm -hmm. To me, an engagement, if you have 2,000 people following you and you have two people or four people or 10 people, whatever, actually engage with that content, that's it's a decent, well, is that a decent proportion? I don't know if that is. I think I've just picked out numbers randomly, but I'd rather, I think engagements are higher because it's someone permitting a lot of the time to be like, this is of interest. Yeah. You do fall into, there are holes in my thought process there in you do get bots and they're yeah. <laughs> So it, it's not quite right, but personally, I, I still think of, I think, and it may be naive in my thought process, and I kind of said it before about people being individuals, but if I look at stuff from a, a nice, the world's great sort of mentality, if there's individual people, if I had a room and there was, and I've sent out a post and I had 10 people like it, and I put those 10 people in a room, I'd be really happy that 10 people in yeah. this room have gone thumbs up. That was great. Yeah, so yeah. I think I think of it a bit like that, like the, in, I want those individual people, the big numbers are great. And I'm also quite lucky. I'm working, I, I'm working with clients who do have quite a large reach and impression. Sure. 
and our focus tends to be more geared to i can i can enjoy these smaller metrics that have in my opinion a higher momentum because again when you talk about b2b events you want the right people attending those events there is a difference there between a consumer event and a, a b2b yeah. because ideally well not always the case but say you've got a big i don't know a presence in a, a shopping center and you want pit footfall you want that okay obviously you want large reach and impression you want people to come by that would be a good kpi of or an objective of that event but from a b2b space you might want a large audience but you want specific people attending because you don't you know yeah, if you're doing yeah. Something construction think... you know you need that audience in attendance so yeah and i think you've got to be, you've got to be realistic haven't you if, the, the larger your audience you have the smaller proportion each individual post is probably going to resonate mm -hmm. with because you, you you can't unless somebody's done this, but I can't think of any situation where you can put one post out and all your social followers would all go, yeah, thumbs up. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, no. it's just not, they're not going to be on the, there at the time, they're going to miss it. They might have come off that platform for a while. Yeah. You know, there's, they, they might be totally objective to it and go, actually, that's the opposite of what I think rather than yeah. that I'm pro that. And, and I guess that's what, is great about social is because there are no barriers to how much you can post and how often yeah. you can actually you can actually do as much to resonate with as much audience as you want but i think it's a really good point that you know a small amount of engagements is still success because you've resonated with with, with those people um i guess if you don't get anybody liking it then maybe you should rethink that one with the individual post i don't know well uh, if you're not getting any engagement then a query would be who do you have following like less about not i think i'd even go step back i'd be like well is this the right platform yeah. and actually what mm. are you trying to get across because also i think people forget and i mean i'm a a strong believer in community management as part of when you look at b2b spaces and a you're gonna you could get far more people engaged with your content if you spent half an hour engaging with other people's content like yeah. and actually seeing what these people are talking about and i don't mean like engaging in a like a what i don't know what the word would be but like you have to be invested in it so don't go in yeah. and just like a whole bunch of stuff but actually find people that are relevant and if you engage in their content they're likely then to see your stuff and be like oh actually this is really good and that if you're not getting any engagements just doing a bit of that would probably help yeah rather than just push right yeah like stop yeah. stop sharing stuff and also i'd say do that before you jump into paid mm -hmm. as much as i value the use of kind of paid media it's like well why don't you figure out your own organic audience because if people click through and they're seeing you ain't getting posts on other stuff yeah. they're not going to take that to be <laughs> to that's, be positive that's, that's a really good piece of advice there i think i think that little step in between is a great way to grow your your social presence and your community engagement and stuff. Mm. I guess my final question, what does the future of social look like for the events industry? Oh. And don't say it depends on what your objective is. No, no, I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't actually going to say it for that one because it's not, it doesn't work like that, does it? Um, oh, what, what does the future, I mean, this is a, this it could be your opinion. It could be like, it could be like yeah. your perfect world. It, it could be what you see what we see well i think i i mean i'm i think we see it in the events industry right i think you're seeing more individuals come forward talking mm. about what they work on and them being the advocates for kind of social i mean uh, Irina, who does kind of the the mice blog and, and yeah. all of that stuff is a big she talks about it as like influencers like mm -hmm. you know i'm not sure i get it in the same traditional sense but i do think that that kind of social and events and in, even in the business area, in the B2B space, it's about the people. Like we talk about how in the events industry, it's a people industry. But fundamentally, if you're selling a product, people are buying from others. It's why influencer marketing works yeah. so exceptionally well. It's why just peer-to-peer -peer recommendations work really well. And I think that's going to be a stronger focus. I mean, you're not going to, I mean, that's why Snapchat exists, TikTok, like why they've come up because it's people doing yeah. things and and you know and that's that's the really important stuff it's that's, that's uh, gonna stand stead i feel stand stead uh, stand strong 
Yes, that's it. That's the one. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, you know, I've come from a slightly different generation than, than some people in my business and, and, and others out there. And, you know, in general, I see a, a big reluctance, maybe fear of people putting themselves forward as a proponent of that brand and that social engagement because mm-hmm. they feel, well, let, let's be face it, to, to put yourself out there on social, you're, you're opening yourself up to be attacked in some way. We know, we know yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a negative side to social. Some people might be not very confident in, in kind of presenting themselves, their own opinions. They, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to open themselves up to, to, to be, to have somebody else have a, have a pop at them. However, um, I've seen a lot of it. Irina is a good, a great example. I, I met Irina right when she first started out and we're still in contact now. And there's other individuals as well out there that are really elevating themselves as a way to um, both community engagement, which is look, look, people buy into so much more, like people buy from people. That, mm-hmm. That's the what, what that company does behind it is sometimes irrelevant because if they don't trust somebody within that business, will they ever buy from them? Will they ever engage mm-hmm. with them? Um, and I think we'll see more of that in terms of companies realizing we need an evangelist. We, we need mm-hmm. a face of company that's, that's confident mm-hmm. to, to post, post their own opinions without fear of reprisal as well, because I'll be honest with you. I, I mean, I'm internally, I'm known as a bit of a maverick because I've kind of, you know, but, but that's my job. Um, I'm allowed <laughs> to um, put very opinionated pieces out there on my own profiles and stuff like that, which probably gets some people up, up the back, but probably resonate really well with other people in a B2B environment you still need to be cautious. I I suppose Mm -hmm. you still need to be somewhat careful, but I think if you're, um, and this is my advice, but I'm an editor of a publication. So it's easy for me to say, I think if you're struggling with content, look to your team internally. Is there one person that would happily take the forefront of that and create Mm -hmm. content like video clips, a podcast, um, you know, you can share on social, all that kind of stuff. Well, I always find, I find it really interesting. Um, because and i mean gpj is pretty good at it we we share like especially on like instagram stories and stuff yep. if people post stuff about work it gets reshared but i've i've definitely come across a lot of companies and a lot of people who talk talk about their team but don't ever actually talk about their team like you don't know mm. who these people are they post a nice picture of them wearing christmas jumpers for like christmas jumper day but then there's no like who are these individuals and yep. i think there's a hesitation and i've definitely come across it where Oh, but if people leave and I'm like, but that's just part and parcel of like life. Like, and actually by bringing the team and the people to the forefront, not only is it, as you say, people, self and people, but think about the fact that you probably have other strategies in attracting talent. And, exactly. Yeah. And you, you know, a lot of this stuff crosses over. So if you start to naturally bring in individuals, you you, A, you show you trust your team. Like these are people I trust and, and you know, yeah, we all know people leave companies. That's not no one's going to look at you badly unless they've left because you're a bad company. But well, I think that's really important part about attracting talent. I've come across uh, even more, more so over the last year of a couple of companies promoting the fact that a team member is leaving to pastures mm-hmm. new. They've used that as a positive to, to say, listen, you know, this person's been with us for the last five years. Maybe they came as an intern. They, they went to this. This is their journey. We, we help them. Yeah. And, you know, it's a natural progression for most people unless they own their own business to get to a point where maybe they, they, they want to challenge themselves with something new, maybe take a different direction. But let's be fair about it. That next opportunity has come from the foundation of all the years experience that they've had at that Mm. last place and and the people around them and the management and all that kind of stuff. So I think, yeah, absolutely. And and for me, thinking back to when I was first starting, if I saw that, that would be really attractive for me to go, well, this these are really positive about the journey and the fact that they've helped that person get their next opportunity. Like I could see that being a huge draw to, to new talent. And I think if you look at what's happening now, where from an event standpoint, there aren't any, mm-hmm. and it's very difficult. It's not the right place to necessarily be marketing products or selling stuff because yep. it's, it's just not right for, for a lot of places. And it's like, well, what makes your, what can you talk about? What actually makes you different? And without a shadow of a doubt, it's, it's the people, it's the team yeah. that is in that company because they're what, 
you know, there's not multiple of me in other places. Like it's, you know, I'm not saying that I'm a male. Well, no, I'm not. <laughs> but like, uh, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's the people, it is the people yeah. that make a company. And, and I think, I think that in itself is an area that goes forward. And I also think if you look at that same thing about people leaving, really the biggest advocates of any company are those who've worked there. And we see it at, for Cisco as well, for Cisco Live. There are people who have attended the event because they, you know, they worked for the company and then they've moved on and they've continued to come back because they see the benefit of it. And so, you know, if, if you're, you've got to think about, I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is the end point of it, but I always think B2B marketing, and it's the same probably with not, with normal marketing, but standard marketing. But when you look at kind of B2B events, I do think it's long-term. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's a long-term focus and, and you're not going to gain everything in, in the space of a year or two years. It could be longer than that. And that is something that is really beneficial to work on. Um, yep. It's kind of, yeah. I, again, I totally agree. I, I feel like I've just agreed with everything you said. Because great, <laughs> don't we? I mean, it's, 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 I, g- generally, I'm very argumentative and I, I, will, I, will, I will go, no, I don't agree with that. But, you know, I, again, from my own experience of when we first set Event Industry News up 10 years ago, I can remember the first person to follow us on social media was me. And, uh, you know, literally from zero to one, I was the, the first. And now organically, we very much got a huge community across across our social platforms. You know, LinkedIn and Twitter are kind of strongest because it's mm. a B2B environment. But it's been a 10-year investment of trying content, repurposing content, trying new things, not being afraid to retweet or promote other people's mm-hmm. controversial viewpoints mm-hmm. and that kind of stuff. And you're very much right in the B2B environment. I think very much sometimes we focus on socials and, and there's some great examples of people that have risen to fame very, very quickly or gained, gained a huge amount of following very, very quickly. But, but overall numbers really don't denote revenue or business mm. or success or anything they it's just interest um mm. you've got to turn that interest into something but it, you know from a from a more practical b2b side it is a long-term investment it's small gradual wins small growth over time adds up to it's a big growth right and then big engagement if you've got that if you've got that stuff right yeah. and i think that goes back to you know some of these people these influencers that have got huge numbers that they get no engagement whatsoever in comparison to somebody that's maybe got, I don't know, 50,000 followers, but gets a huge amount of engagement on a once a month basis. Mm. Caitlin, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to bring you back and quiz you some more in, in, in some other areas around social. For anybody that's listening to this podcast and wants to go and follow you and nick all your ideas, because let's be honest with yeah. you, that's what they're going to do. <laughs> um, where can they find you? Where can, what's what Cisco's handles if they want to kind of check out the work that you guys guys do there and stuff? Um, well, Cisco, you can find it across all social, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we're at Cisco Live Europe um, and also hashtag Claire, which is C-L-E-U-R, which is okay. an easier one to remember. Uh, for me personally, um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram and, and LinkedIn, but um, I'm blog by Cobrac which is an old school name based on years ago. And I used to write a blog as a teenager uh, and yep. it's weirdly stuck uh, with me. And then obviously um, GPJ, if you type in GPJ UK, you can find our website and all the social channels from there. I, I also have that challenge trying to explain to people what Punchdown <laughs> Parry means with my, <laughs> although it's very unique and I never have a problem getting an account anywhere because nobody's got it. <laughs> you know, I, it's when I say it out loud and I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. Like, I don't mind it. And then I'm, and then I'm like, oh, I'm just, it's like when you had emails as a kid and they were really embarrassing hotmail emails. It's a little bit like that. <laughs> yeah, I wish I was that hot on social to be one of the first and got like Adam at Twitter or oh. something like that. Wouldn't that be the, wouldn't that, that be would the be thing? That would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, Caitlin, again, thank you very much for, for having us on, uh, for being on the, <laughs> on the podcast today. Or having me on, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Everyone listening or viewing today's podcast, if you enjoyed what Caitlin said today, which I personally did, do give this podcast a share, a like. It really helps with discovery and hopefully some of what Caitlin says will resonate with your own personal community. Um, Thanks again, everyone, for listening in and we'll see you in the next one.